Nelson. Welcome back to Frank's School. This is the fifth day of the fourth year, first video and only video. Kodak to the rescue, uh, maybe. Uh, I'm using a different camera, uh, and uh, maybe the, the sound problem ha has been resolved now. Shirley has come to the rescue. Uh, I, all, for four years now, this is the fourth year, Shirley, my German friend, has been helping me all the time. She helps me, and she's been saying, use the Kodak. She gave me that Kodak. Let me see. I might be able to straighten it up just a little bit. She gave me that Kodak so that I would use it, but the flip worked. Well, in any case, uh, thanks, Shirley. Hope it works. Terry Osmond, uh, he, he sent me a comment about uh, what I said yesterday, uh, and I guess it's not on YouTube. He must have sent it to me privately or by Facebook or something. Probably, probably by Facebook, I guess it was. <clears throat> well, he's a fabulous pianist. He accompanied the Dutch Corner Concert Choir for years, and really there's almost nothing you could put in front of him that he couldn't play brilliantly. And he, uh, that's his career, that's his profession. And he has accompanied the Pirates of Penzance probably many times. He knows this very well. And he said uh, he, that, that he had often thought about the sat a G. And Terry uh, was raised on a farm, and they had workhorses. Uh, when he was young, and he pointed out that there was G and Haw, the two uh, commands that you, you, you give a workhorse to turn to the right or turn to the left. And uh, <clears throat> he'd often thought that, well, maybe that was riding side saddle. I guess it would be on the right-hand side, he pointed out, uh, which would be the wrong side. He, he, he he'd thought about this. I'm sorry his comment didn't go on to uh, YouTube because uh, it was pretty... It was pretty cool that he had thought about that, pondered about it, and came up with this. And, and he wrote set a G with a hyphen in it, uh, to the right, sat to the right. Now, I assumed a G was a horse. You sat on a horse because in the uh, uh, movie, uh, the, the guy the second time through says, rode a horse. Well, rode a horse would be a diagram like this, rode horse, rode a horse. This is a direct object, you ride the horse. Uh, with the hyphen sat a G. Now it says, how did you sit on the horse? Uh, and a G would be uh, now, uh, or at that time, a, if it was uh, written like that, it would be a, uh, an adverb modifying sat, but uh, the result of an original, of an archaic on the right. Well, anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to point out Gilbert's rhyming. Uh, uh, his rhyming, he, he uh, I told Terry when I replied to him uh, that I think uh, Gilbert, sometimes I think he was a genius. Now, <laughs> sometimes I also think misapplied because of these Victorians. But, but what he could do with words, he rhymes often with two or even three syllables. Uh, sentiment, emollient, you're, you're going to see that. Uh, uh, and uh, hypoten hypotenuse. Ver veritable truth. Uh, well, hypotenuse is an example of it. Uh, but it's strategy, strategy. I mean, you can rhyme just on the last syllable, and it works. But uh, rhyming with two syllables is harder, and sometimes three. Well, he, he was a master with his words. Uh, and maybe because of that, he also uses pretty big words. Uh, another thing uh, I wanted to point out is his, uh, uh, is his verse form. Um, of the veritable truths about the square of the hypotenuse. I don't even know what that's called, uh, I, uh, the, the name of that verse form. I, I, I mean, I had taught elsewhere in a course about uh, terms of verse. Uh, you know, there, there are the feet. It's, it's for, uh, it's, uh, it's tetrameter. Uh, let's see, this is, and in, uh, and in matters. I, I am the very model of a matter, matter major general. So, so in matters, vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very mo I am the very model of a modern major general. Uh, it it, I've heard that. I wish I knew the name for that. Uh, it's effective to tell a very fast story. I've heard it actually in a country western song, which I've never been able to quite find again. Uh, so, uh, begin it, in it, <laughs> I'd like to point out that rhyme, there, there, there's something. But anyway, in, oh, and this, I should deal with this too, uh, this, what you're going to see today is 
some of the most, well, and yesterday is some of the most fun here, orphan and often. Well, in my dialect, these don't sound that much alike, orphan, often. Uh, the, my spelling system, I, I would go uh, orphan, orphan, and this would be often. Uh, they're not the same. But uh, in a British dialect, or, or uh, I assume, they're, they're so close. Uh, and the way they act this out, that there's confusion over this. And uh, the major general says that he's an orphan, and, and they play with the fact that those, there's that misunderstanding. And, and uh, that's so tricky because uh, the, the pirate king says, yes, I repeated the word often, frequently, only once. Uh, so clever, so, so clever, this writing. But then it go launches into... Uh, uh, the apostrophe uh, to poetry, suddenly, hail poetry. I love this part of the uh, uh, comic opera. I've used it in concerts, and I've led up with the other songs just to be able to do this. The whole uh, chorus bursts into a cappella singing, uh, hail poetry. Now, it's called an apostrophe. That's a literary term for when you uh, address somebody that's not alive anymore, or uh, a non-living thing, uh, an inanimate object, if you speak to it in a poem. Well, that's what this is. It, it's, it's an apostrophe. You could also call it an ode, ode to autumn, ode to a Grecian urn, or two famous examples that Keats wrote, where he uh, spoke to something that was inanimate. It is a cappella, strictly. The, the, the orchestra stops completely. The dynamics are done, uh, dynamics refers to whether something's really loud or really soft and how fast uh, it goes from one to the other. And the dynamics are, are extreme, absurdly extreme. I mean, they're, they're always playing, they're so playful, but it is so good. <laughs> uh, it hushes uh, at one point and then it builds. Uh, and uh, as it's coming to the end, it's quite a short piece, but wonderful. And as I said, I've had my choir do it because it's so, uh, so much fun. Uh, sentiment, uh, divine, divine emollient is the last word. Uh, it calls a flowing fount of sentiment, <laughs> a fountain that's flowing with sentiment. Uh, and then all hail, all hail divine emollient. Well, what's that? What's an emollient? <laughs> You know, that people know that back in the Victorian times? I think you'd probably have to look it up. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I've looked it up before or not, but I know what it is. It's something that makes so something softer. I know it because mole in Portuguese is soft. And uh, I always end up thinking of meat tenderizer, a papaya plant. If you take the juice from a papaya plant and put it on a stain on your hand, it would take it off. That's, that's where meat tenderizer comes from. Uh, papaya juice, or at least it, it did. So anyway, it's something that softens, all right? And so poetry softens life, even for the pirate's trade. Um, and as they're singing that, as they reach the final note, listen to the highest tenor. He, he sails up on a really high note that, that's, that if you listen, it's, it's above everything else. It's just a wonderful moment. And it's very close to the end of Act One. Uh, it's too bad that in cutting it up into 15-minute sections, it, it, it cut off uh, 50 seconds early. It doesn't matter. You get to hear that whole. Uh, you get to hear that whole a cappella uh, moment. Uh, but then, if you go to the fifth out, out of eight uh, parts, uh, again, uh, mega best, and go to the 50th second, then you've reached uh, the end of the uh, of Act One. All right, uh, I guess that's probably enough for today. I, I hope you uh, are watching this. I, I also hope you get a better uh, version of it uh, when you watch it or if you use it in school. But uh, we'll see you tomorrow.